All right. Okay, I think we're live on Facebook now on Water and Climate Group. Beautiful, beautiful. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for spending your, well, it's my evening. I'm sure as we move across the country, it's your afternoon, but right. Right. <laughs> we are definitely well into my evening. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Hard, if you want, I can just roll right into this. Let's, uh, let's just chat for, you know, five minutes or so. Give people a chance to show up. I think it's right. kind of interesting. It's all about green infrastructure and catching water and doing it right. I don't know. Absolutely. That's exactly what we're going over. Feel free to introduce yourself. Uh, we got Marin Cook from Pennsylvania, Beate Rose from Kentucky. Um, Nancy, where are you from? Oh. How do I answer that? <laughs> And Marin brings her kitty cat. <laughs> Excellent. This is a class for everybody. He came we're, all, to me. we're all affected by climate, so this is all good. Marin's in Pittsburgh. Uh, she has a really good show, the, uh, a good regular program via Zoom. It's called Sustainability Salons, and it used to be a giant potluck mini conference and now it's a sizable zoom mini conference every mm -hmm. month for the last 10 years talked about all kinds of different environmental topics mm. had lots of great speakers oh man i think so, i messed it up uh if anybody's interested shoot me your email in the chat okay sounds good and, uh oh yeah i haven't actually got the link to the next one yet a couple more minutes and we'll let uh, Trevor introduce himself and, and we'll start. All right, perfect. Um, and if everybody could just be more than uh, more than welcome to do questions, we should probably maybe just we'll save questions to the end, uh, just because I'm really nervous about whether I'm going to be able to stay within the timeline and I want to make sure that everybody stays on. Uh, so if, I guess if you could all mute yourselves and um, I'm assuming I get a thumbs up with the screen share. So yeah, um, yeah. So my name is Trevor Smith. I am a regenerative land care professional and have been for the past 20 years. I use regenerative land care rather than eco landscaper or green landscaper because it is my belief that uh, we need to regenerate and start working with mother nature systems helping kind of undo some of the things that we've done, restore the balance uh, so that these, these natural systems can begin to take care of themselves. And my focus is very much on bridging that gap between the built environment, which is a thing. So we, we're not going back. The built environment is our thing and the natural world. And I absolutely know, and I think everybody on here knows that we can, have, we can certainly live in harmony and we can certainly have in our built environment and as human beings, we can have all of the things that we want. Uh, we just have to design smarter and, and, uh, and, and work for it smarter. So I certainly don't believe that our um, answer to the climate crisis or our answer to any of this is to go without. I don't necessarily meet, think that we need to go without. I think that we need to find ways that we can have all the things that we want. Um, and, we, and that's just going to uh, cause us to create smarter design. So I guess the best example of that um, is the infinite hot shower. Let's, you know, we all at the end of a day or sometimes in the morning, we like a nice hot shower. We jump in the shower, we're in there. We're loving it. It just feels so good on us. But then like after a while, we start to feel like a little guilty. We're like, wow, I'm really getting carried away in here. This is a lot of water. I really got to, you know, cut this out. Well, instead of being like, all right, everybody gets a three minute shower, you know, let's let's go through. Why don't we find a way to have that hot shower? So, you know, what if we approached it as if we had 
solar heating for our water. So a, a, a tub or a shower is gonna take about 50 gallons. Let's just say that 50 gallons went up to the roof, got heated via solar, came down, it was beautiful, wonderful hot shower, went down and then went through a filter and just went through that system again. So we were consistently showering in that same 50 gallons, which was being filtered. Well, then we could, we could essentially stay in that hot shower for as long as we wanted or until our family beat down the door. And then from there, what if that water went out into a gray water tank and then we were able to use that water to water our landscapes? You know, our lawns or whatever, we were able to use that water to you know, wash our cars, things that we don't need potable water for. We certainly don't need drinking water to wash our cars, but you know, we do need to wash our cars sometimes. So you know, these are things. So what I'm saying is uh, very much what my, my beliefs and uh, my business has been about for the past 20 years is trying to bridge that gap and trying to find solutions so that we don't have to go without because the moment you tell somebody they have to go without, they're just gonna dig in and they're not gonna jump on board with whatever has to happen. So we have to look to find a world of abundance for all. So uh, what this tonight's uh, little talk is going to be about, uh, I am going to touch on green infrastructure. Now this is a huge topic and I don't have a lot of time. So I'm really going to just touch on green infrastructure um, and essentially, ways that I believe we need to start thinking about climate and ways that we can attack climate change. Now, from being in this Facebook group, I know that many people in this group are familiar with some of the things I'm going to talk about, some of the methods, uh, and definitely some of these beliefs. So as I mentioned, I'm a regenerative land, land care professional. So this is how I look at the world. We've been on for much of the industrial revolution. And you can even go way before that because the Romans weren't so great to the planet either. But for much of the industrial revolution, we've been on this degradation track. So now we're here. So if you look at where we are now, think of it like the COVID crisis. Well, we don't wanna start thinking about sustainability now. If we think about sustainability now, we're gonna be living like we have been living for the past two years indefinitely. So what I would like us to start doing is start thinking about regeneration and start using that and if we use that in our, if it's a part of our vernacular, it's going to be part of our daily practice and start thinking about sustainability as a level that we need to achieve. This is where we need to go. So we don't want sustainability now. Don't talk about that now. Talk about regeneration now and sustainability later. So before I fully get going, what I feel, where I feel I need to start is at the beginning. And I am going to Take the moment just to reintroduce everybody to water. Water is H2O, hydrogen two parts, oxygen one. But there is a third thing that makes it water and nobody knows what it is. Now, one of the reasons I am so enamored with water and I have been since I was, well, forever, because I remember dragging my grandmother to the Kmart side of the Kmart parking lot so we could look at the little the little stream down the side. So water is amazing for one reason, um, because it is part of our daily routine. Is it, it is a part of our life and our every day. We shower, we brush our teeth, we make our tea and coffee. We are literally bathed in water at all times. That being said, water somehow still holds the key to all things magical and majestic. So if you are ever on a beach and watching the breakers roll in, or if you're ever going on a hike and you come across a river or a stream or even a waterfall, you can't help but be swept up in the magic and majesty of water. So that's, that is one of the first reasons that I absolutely love water because it is just so paradoxical. It's, it's everyday routine and it's just everything beautiful and magical. Now, over 50% of the water on the planet right now was actually in existence before planet Earth was ever formed. And much of the rest of the water is debated on how it came, whether it came together when the gases were formed. The working theory is that as we got struck by asteroids and the like, the rest of the water um, made its way to the planet. But the universe, space, is a very wet place. Um, and one of the next things that I really love about water is that when you hear about space, when you hear about a comet that comes around 
every 400 years, or when you hear about Pluto, you hear about ice. We're in space and on these planets looking for ice. We have ice in our freezer, which is just, to me, is just so cool. So like I have something in common with that comet that I'm not gonna see again for another lifetime or another two lifetimes. It's not gonna be back. But that has ice and I have ice. So another thing that's super cool about water is that it connects us to the entire universe. So since the creation of Earth, for the most part, water has not been created nor destroyed. It's just been recycled again and again and again. So every molecule of water, every molecule of water in this glass right now that I'm drinking, has seen the inside of a cloud. It's been inside of a tree. Every single molecule of water on this planet has been inside of a volcano, but it has also been inside of a dinosaur's kidneys. So that coffee you drink, that shower you take, it is all dinosaur pee. We drink and bathe dinosaur pee, no questions asked. That's what it is every single day. <laughs> However, because water has not been created nor destroyed, one of the things that I find extremely beautiful about it is that a molecule of water in my glass could have been a mother's tear as she held her baby for the first time. It could have been somebody's last breath. It could have been a bead of sweat on a laborer as they built the pyramids. So again, what's awesome about water is it connects us through time. It connects us to the universe, but it connects us to each other through time. So what is the problem? Well, there's a lot. But since 1980, the number of extreme meteorological events has doubled. And we see scenes like this quite a bit. This is here in Boston at the New England Aquarium. And in some parts of the country, we're starting to see scenes like this. See, water is becoming very unpredictable. So when I was growing up, April showers bring May flowers. Well, actually, that's really not true because it rained like all but three days in July, but April itself wasn't really that wet. So mm, it's not really a thing anymore. However, other places where I've gone to speak and when I talk to friends around the country, they're, they're dying for water. They're hurting because the water hasn't been making its way there and they haven't been seeing the water that used to come so readily. So climate change, the way this is working is it's just making, especially water, unpredictable. We need to rethink water because like I said, we very much take water for granted. Now, this is in Boston. We have a water main break in Boston probably every four months. Every three to four months, you will hear about a water main break. Part of the reason is this. This is from 2019, and the water main break was a pipe from the 19th century. Now, you guys, it doesn't sound like many of you are from here. Let me just tell you the size of Boston and its population and its water demand has grown a little bit since the 19th century. What has happened? is that we built our water infrastructure and we built our stormwater, our gray, gray, you know, our gray infrastructure years and years ago. And it's crumbling and we've just been throwing Band-Aids on it to the point where if we are to start again or update it all, that is going to be billions and billions of dollars. And most municipalities or say towns don't even know how to begin. So where I live in Arlington, our, our system is about 80 years old. And I know the population has probably more than doubled in the past 80 years. So we really need to start thinking about water. However, for those of us in the stormwater management business, this is an opportunity. Because for instance, in Boston, it's going to take a long time for them to be able to update their, their, uh, their gray water systems or their storm systems, their gray infrastructure. But what we offer using green infrastructure actually keeps much of that water out. So these antiquated pipes that are getting overwhelmed with the amount of water that's rushing into them and flooding back out onto the streets or ejecting into our streams and harbors, 
you know, we can actually take some of that water out of the equation. So we really do hold the key to the relief that our municipalities are looking for. But as I was saying, we need to take responsibility for water because I drove past this for almost an entire summer at about 4.30 in the morning. When I get up and go, that's when these sprinkler systems were off. Now, granted, nobody else was out there. Nobody else was that crazy to be out at 4.30 in the morning. However, you must have known. There must have been an indication with the sopping wet area when they mowed the lawn. This was at an office park. But we need to take responsibility. Cities need to take their responsibility, but we need to take responsibility as land care professionals. If this is what you do, that's, this is something that you need to do. So we stop seeing things like this. So what's happening is we have events, we turn on the news, and they tell us about a flooding problem. That's the big problem right there, because we don't have a flooding problem. We have an infiltration problem. And if we call it what it is, then we know how to fix it. When we have flooding, what we try to do is move the water away. We're on a planet floating in the middle of the universe. There is no way. There is just somewhere else. But if we call it what it is, an infiltration problem, then our minds start thinking, well, how can we infiltrate this water? Instead of getting rid of it, how do we infiltrate it? So again, we have to, one, the first way to confront this problem is to start calling things what they are. Everything we ever needed to know, we learned in fifth grade. When we had to deal with this right here, the water cycle, we didn't care. We didn't take it seriously enough. However, all the answers to our problems are right here in this image. Now, if you just pay a little bit of attention to this image, there's no quiz on the other end, so don't even worry about it. But you'll see in the natural system, before we came and we started doing anything, the natural system, the way it would work, there's less than 1% runoff. If you see there on the left-hand side, we have 40 to 50% evapotranspiration. Now that's, the, that's all that vegetation just releasing water back into the air. <clears throat> we have interflow. We have water that's making its way into the earth. Now in the perfect world or even now, but what happens in a watershed, if you'll recall from fifth grade, is it rains and the water slowly makes its way down to the lowest point. That can take weeks or, you know, it can take days, weeks, all the water just slowly makes its way down to the rivers. This is what we're dealing with now, the urban water cycle. So you can see we have 20 to 30% surface runoff. We have zero to 30% interflow. The water's not making it in. 20 to 30% evapotranspiration because we don't have the green space that we used to have. This is huge. And this is what causes the image that you saw just a little bit ago because all that water now makes its way through the watershed in minutes and in huge volume. So instead of working into the soil and having gravity pull it down over the course of the week, it runs right over the course of the, right over the top of the ground and boom, it's in the river. So of course the river is gonna flow because when mother nature designed that river, she designed it perfectly so that it could just to slowly swell as the waters came down, but it would be gently moving. So it wouldn't just take over everything. But then we came along and we kind of had a better plan. We thought we knew better than what was there. So you can see in the beginning, there is actually a flood plan for every single waterway. But then we were like, you know what, we're going to put this waterway in a pipe because we got some plans here. And this one, if we just kind of straighten this out, we can really use this area a lot more. And Mother Nature's like, yeah, but that's my flood plan. So this is what happens when you mansplain to Mother Earth. So our two main issues really are supply and demand and stormwater runoff. Now supply and demand is real easy and it's not something that I'm going to spend a whole lot of time on. You know, at our rate of consumption and where water is falling and how reliable it is, we are going to start experiencing water loss or lack of water. Each year we have about 36 states, if not more, that experience droughts or water shortages. And there are states that experience water shortages even under non-drought conditions. 
We have to think that the average U.S. household, you know, is using about 5,000 gallons a week with a 10,000 square foot lot. When you have, you know, an ornamental landscape and all the beds and the lawn and everything, you're looking at 5,000 gallons a week. Here's the one that people don't consider. Each one of us uses approximately 220 gallons in electricity consumption per day. So it takes a lot of water to produce electricity, something that we don't think about. So while I think the electric car is great, it, we, are, we are reducing emissions in some ways and we are upping our water consumption in others. So we really need to zoom out and look at the big picture when we talk about this stuff. Not just in the electric car, but what I'm saying is, does anybody actually take into consideration the water that goes into that? You know, because we are talking about the watersheds, you know, if I put in a low flow toilet and low flow faucets, I am not going to save anybody any water in Kentucky or in um, Ghana. It's not going to happen because that's not how watersheds work. However, if I use low energy consumption and I'm uh, more aware of my electricity, then overall, that is one way that I can kind of reduce on a larger scale and more of a planetary scale because water needs to recycle. So that is one way that you can actually affect the planet uh, in your water use. But like I said, I'm not gonna spend time on that. We're here for stormwater runoff. So that was your brief water introduction, but now you need to understand that in a one inch rain event on one acre of land, that equals 27,000 gallons of water. So like when it's raining and it's happening and the, you know, the weather report says, oh, we got an inch, we got an inch and a half. And you know, I live on a postage stamp. Some people live on acres and acres, but you have to understand that's 27,000 gallons of water that just fell out of the sky. When you think of a shopping mall, the roof alone on that mall is like you know, three, four acres. And the parking lots are another like five acres. So think of all that water that is running off of those ill-designed parking lots. Now, where does that go? Well, that goes away. It goes into a pipe and gets ejected into our streams and rivers. So, and then we wonder why those streams and rivers are overflowing. So if one acre of land, which like I said, in my neck of the woods seems kind of big, we can break this down. That same inch of water on a 2,000 square foot roof is 1,250 gallons. Now, 2,000 square foot roof is you know, a mid size, it's an average size, a little on the larger size house. <clears throat> but you can look at like your driveway or whatever, 2,000 square feet, that's manageable. You can, you can picture that in your head. Now, here in the Northeast, we get 41 to 47 inches of rainfall a year. So let's just say where I am and I pay for my water. This would make rain harvesting seem like a good idea because that's, you know, when you anywhere you pay for your water, that's money falling from the sky. So if you're able to capture that and use that for when your town has a water ban, well, wouldn't that be great? So that is an argument for, say, rain harvesting systems. It's also, again, an argument for infiltration. What difference does it make if the glass is half empty or half full if the water is polluted? So we need to think about water, but we need to think about the quality of our water. And we need to think about maybe respecting that water that we take for granted, because in reality, without it, we're not here. So it's funny how something that is the whole reason that there is any life on this planet is the one thing that we pay the least attention to and actually advocate for through laws and through everything the least. And, you know, if any of our water bills go up and we don't pay, I don't know what any of you pay for water, but I'm just going to say for really what water's worth, we don't really pay that much. You know, I, people pay $4 to get, you know, a, a liter of, you know, of water, but they get mad if, you know, they have to pay an extra 10 cents on their water bill. So it like, really doesn't make sense. But for the rest of this conversation, I just want to kind of make sure that we're all using the same terminology. So what is stormwater? When I'm talking about stormwater, I'm talking water originating from rainfall or snowmelt, runs across the land, 
but is unable to infiltrate into the ground because of these uh, paved surfaces. And along the way, it's going to pick up pollutants, sediments, et cetera, as it's making its way along those surfaces. So that's when I'm talking stormwater, I'm talking the runoff from rainfall and snow melt. This is Arlington. So what happens is raindrops fall at 20 miles an hour. When you have a head like mine, you know that raindrops fall at 20 miles an hour. And what they do is they hit our unpaved surfaces and they pick up speed. And when they pick up speed, they cause damage. I, you will find me more often than not out in any rainstorm taking pictures of the damage that stormwater runoff causes. And then we have this. This is a Boston snowbank at the end of March. And where does all this go? Oh, all that goes here. And where does all that go? Well, that goes out to the bay or that goes out to the river. So again, we're not making all of the connections because all of those lazy dog owners in that snowbank weren't really taking into consideration the repercussions of what happens when all that washes away. It doesn't go away, it goes into our waterways. So what is the answer? I feel the answer is nature-based solutions. I am an advocate for green infrastructure. Green infrastructure is an approach to stormwater management that protects, restores, or mimics the natural water cycle. Some examples of green infrastructure are bioretention, uh, bioswales or bioretention systems, which include rain gardens, permeable pavements, and porous asphalts, and then things like green roofs and even dry wells can be considered uh, green infrastructure. So green infrastructure, as I said, it's stormwater management practices that protect, restore, and mimic the, na the native hydraulic conditions by providing infiltration, filtration, natural filtration, storage, evaporation, and evapotranspiration. Like I said, regenerative land care professional. When I think of how do we manage stormwater, let's get the systems back online. Let's infiltrate it. Let's design systems that can take that water running off that probably has those pollutants and filtrate it using nature systems, the soil, the microbes, the plants. And then let's, if you, through evapotranspiration, let's get that back up through storage, let's get that in the soil and let's try to keep that water in the soil. The environmental benefits of green infrastructure are very obvious. We have water quality treatment, we have flow control, we have habitat aesthetics and reducing the heat island effect. These are all huge things, all huge. And you'll be like, aesthetics, really? Is that huge? Absolutely, biophilia, you know, it, it has been proven that when you see green space, they've done it on hospital patients, they've done it on people in office buildings, anybody, it is good for our mental health. We evolved with nature. So if we can put more nature around us, it is going to be better for our health. The habitat, it is going to be better in maintaining our ecosystems and our biodiversity. And the cooling, of course, reducing the heat island effect is going to be huge because it directly affects A, human health, but also rainfall. But how is all this gonna save the world? Well, let's look at CO2. The excess CO2 in the air, is that, is, that, is that the problem? No, that's a symptom of the problem. That flooding that we talked about, is the flooding the problem? No, infiltration is the problem. The flooding is a symptom of the problem. Everything you needed to know you learned in fifth grade. We come right back to this, the water cycle. 95% of the earth's heating and cooling is controlled by the hydrological cycle. Let that sink in just for a second. And then you'll understand exactly why we're focusing on nature-based solutions. 25% of solar radiation is transferred back through transpiration. So if we have more vegetation, if we have more green space, then we have more transpiration. That evapotranspiration is going to combat solar radiation. Solar radiation is heating the planet. 
One third of solar radiation is reflected back by clouds. Well, when we have heat islands or heat bubbles due to open farmland, due to open pavement and just built up cities, when we have these heat islands and these heat bubbles, we push the clouds away. If we have clouds, then we have solar reflectivity. Underneath those clouds, we have a cooler planet. All real easy. And then it all comes down to this, the soil carbon sponge. The answer is right beneath our feet. When you're looking at soil, soil is real easy. Sand, silt, and clay, air, water, and soil organic matter. This is the piece that we're not paying enough attention to. What happens if you increase or decrease that soil organic matter? For every 1% increase in soil organic matter, soils will hold 20 to 25,000 gallons of water per acre. So if we have healthy soils, we can then have a healthy hydrologic cycle and the water will be there and the water will be in the ground for the plants and the water will be in the ground for our drinking and the water will be in the ground for our natural heating and cooling systems. Compaction is really our enemy. That is, that is the enemy and this is our built environment, our impervious surfaces and our compaction. The loss of pore space in the soils makes it impossible for water storage. If we don't have water storage, we don't have plants and healthy plants. Then we don't have that evapotranspiration. See how it all just kind of connects together? So preventing compaction as a landscape professional, as a land care professional, really should be like one of my number one concerns in the construction industry. It should be a huge concern because compaction, if you take like a bobcat or an excavator over wet soils during construction, you can compact that soil down to two to three feet. Well, you're not gonna get that with a core aerator afterwards. So this is something that we see all the time. And what I do is I teach a site analysis course. And in that site analysis course for stormwater, I say, if you come across new construction, this is what it looked like six months before or whatever, before they graded it out and just threw four inches of topsoil on it. And then he hydro seeded it or rolled out some sod and put in that dinky foundation planting. This is what it looks like underneath, dead compacted dirt. The subsoil has all been brought to the surface, no life. It's been churned, it's been squeezed. They were doing this construction, you can see when it was wet and they do it when it's dry, it doesn't matter. So all that subsurface is beaten up. Then the four inches of topsoil, what's that gonna do? And what does this do for our stormwater? So often I go to new developments with people who have massive flooding problems, massive flooding problems in their yards, Maybe they're even getting water in their basement. They're like, how am I getting water in my basement? It's a new construction. This is how it all happens. And I say, well, we need to get going on a routine here to decompact the soil because it's probably compacted two feet down. So we have to think about what we're doing. And when we're addressing a site, we have to think about the history of that site and who probably didn't care about compaction, who cared more about their deadline. As I said, compaction is the enemy. Carbon is not the enemy. Carbon is just out of place and out of balance. I am made of carbon. Dinner is made of carbon. We constantly look for a place to point fingers. We're constantly looking for blame. We're looking for one answer, either one silver bullet to save it all or one thing to blame. There is about 130 billion excess <clears throat> tons of carbon in our atmosphere. 4% of that is from fossil fuels. So like I said, I'm all about eliminating fossil fuel. It is part of the solution, but it is not going to, if we just stopped using fossil fuel today, tonight, that's it, no, no more starting tomorrow. It would not save us. I know some people have said that it absolutely will. I do not believe it. We need to do more than this because it only makes up about 4% of that 130 billion tons in the atmosphere. Every gram 
of carbon sequestered holds eight grams of water. So this is a huge, a huge boon for all of us because if we can beef up our soil organic matter and have open pore space and all of that, and if we can get more carbon sequestered into the soil, then we'll have more water holding capacity. And we already just talked at nauseum about all the wonderful things that will happen when we have water in the soil. 25% of our atmospheric carbon is captured by trees. Trees are actually the easiest, simplest, most basic form of green infrastructure. The problem with trees, at least in an urban setting, is we put them in little tree coffins and they have about a five year lifespan. We need to plant trees for longevity. We need to plant trees so they look like this. When they look like this, then they are sequestering carbon. Then they are actually helping with uh, our, st our stormwater control because trees catch that raindrop falling at 20 miles an hour and gently set it to the ground. Now it's lost its velocity. That reduces erosion. Trees pull carbon out of the air. That's great. Trees are great for evapotranspiration. They cool the air around us. Everyone wants to park in the shade. No one wants to plant a tree. So where do trees come from? Trees come from thin air. Because if trees came from soil, there'd be big massive amounts of soil missing. Trees themselves come from thin air. Trees are made by photosynthesis. You and I are just recycled sunlight. The whole process starts with photosynthesis and carbon and carbohydrates being made. And then those carbohydrates get pushed down into the soil in form of sugar, which is carbon. And those not gonna go deep into this cause you, you, know, you know it or you can learn it, but essentially the majority of a tree's sugars are going down into the soil. They're going down to feed the soil life. It is the soil life and not the soil that makes the nutrients available. A root touching soil can't take anything up. A root touching living soil with microbes and fungi and everything in it, they digest the rock. They make the water and everything available to the roots. And in exchange, the roots exude sugar, exudates, they exude sugar and feed them. So it's this big trade-off and that's how that all works. I'm sure many of you know that, but again, the, all of our answers are so simple. It's, it's all so simple and we're just overcomplicating it. When all we really gotta do, you could really just plant a tree and now you're fighting climate change. It doesn't have to be that hard. So you need to understand that plants need rain, but rain needs plants. Because without plants and an abundance, you don't have those clouds. And without those clouds, then we're not gonna have rain. So it is a huge circle. And once you start taking pieces of the equation out, like having lots of bare soil or impervious surface, we start running into problems. <clears throat> Here's a perfect example. This is a picture of the Ascension Islands. Best picture if I could find, sorry. So in the back there, you have Green Mountain. In the foreground, you have Bald Mountain. So way back, um, way, way back, around uh, Darwin's time or whichever, this was a naval base. The, essential, the Ascension Islands were a naval base and they had goats here and the goats ate everything. So everything looked like Bald Mountain in the front. And then Darwin and um, Dr. Hooker both came here and they revegetated one of the mountains just to see what would happen. Well, Green Mountain in the back, which is only seven miles away from Bald Mountain there in the front, gets 30% more rainfall. Down in Colombia, Las Gaviotas, you can check that up. It's a, big, it's a big sustainable community. They planted 1.5 million trees. Well, this area, this microclimate gets 10% more rainfall than the surrounding area. Again, plants need rain, rain needs plants. So here's something that you won't find in a climate model. It is speculated that as few as 50 trees, now we have to talk mature trees, 50 trees per acre are enough to affect the microclimate and affect the amount of moisture in that area. Now you're not gonna find that in the climate model. It's all anecdotal because the money goes to scientists 
who study things that people want studied. And nobody's going to study certain things, but that doesn't mean that they're not real. It just means they're not funded. So when we're planting, and this is from my friend Claudia West book, when we're planting, we need to plant in layers and we need to make sure that we have green mulch. We need to make sure that we have the trees to catch the water, but then those need to, that they need to be able to set that water down. And we need to have roots at different layers because those deep, deep roots are going to get water, bring up water, bring up nutrients and everything from deep, deep in the soil. And those shallow roots are going to do, they're gonna do their thing and they're gonna process the water and hold the water right there. And all of those deep roots and shallow roots are all gonna be pumping carbon into that soil. So now we're sequestering the carbon and every one gram of carbon sequestered is eight grams of water holding capacity. Changes that impede the presence of ground cover, notably desertification, and deforestation, have a negative impact on green water. This is significant because water held in the soil <clears throat> is what most directly and efficiently affects a community's ability to grow food. Indeed, while water planning and policy focuses on irrigation, most of the world's agriculture is rain fed. Water in Plain Sight, great book, one of the, one of the, the basic manuals uh, when you're going down this road. So now I'm just gonna give you just a few final thoughts as we talked about. Take care of the little things and the big things will take care of themselves. If you look at climate change as a whole, of course you think that we need the governments of the world to do something. But we've been talking about climate change for a real long time and waiting for the governments of the world to do something. So I really feel, or I've taken it upon myself to do everything that I can. So what does that mean? I design smarter and I design with mother nature. What else does that mean? That means that I get to spend my evening with you hoping to inspire you to design smarter and start working with mother nature and inspire other people to start doing their things because everything that's ever done and made any change has been grassroots. One of my favorite sayings ever, and I absolutely live by it. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. If we go around telling people you're doing it wrong, then they're just gonna dig in and not do anything. The best example of, of this quote right here is your cell phone, because every year they come out with a new phone and every year it makes your phone obsolete. So is, if we can do that with green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, if we can do that, with our approach to the planet and our approach to um, climate resilience, then we will just make all these old models obsolete. I am tired of waiting around for bigger entities to get their act together. I have my act together today and that's what we're on. The National Green Infrastructure Certification Program is a national certification, as it says right there. Uh, it is held by EnviroCert, um, which is a certification organization this is a training that I hold a couple times a year. It's held all over the country. I will be holding one in February um, via Zoom. So if you went to EnviroCert, or if you go to the Ecological Landscape Alliance website, or if you go to the Connecticut NOFA website, or if you go to the Weston Nurseries in Hopkinton, Massachusetts website, they, are all, they all have registration links for this. So if green infrastructure is something you want to make part of your business, what this certification does, it's an entry level certification. It, you will become certified in the construction, the maintenance and the inspection of green infrastructure. So this is green infrastructure 101. It's a 35 hour course, but if you are going to bring it into the wheelhouse of your company, uh, or if you are going to make say inspecting green infrastructure, if you live in an area where bioswales and, and permeable pavements and the like are starting to spring up all over the place, somebody's going to need make, to make sure that those were done right. So this is a program that I found and I jumped on to teach it because we need more than anything, 
green infrastructure professionals out there because the architects are designing it and they're there and the town and the towns and municipalities, the EPA, everybody's saying we need more and more of this, but we don't necessarily have a plethora of people who know how to implement this stuff. So this, like I said, is a 101 course, 35 hours, gets you certified. That right there is me. Trevor Smith, I thank you so much for spending your portion, this portion of your evening, early evening or late evening, depending on where you are with me. This is how you can connect with me. This is how I hope you will connect with me. If you decide to tackle a green infrastructure project and you don't know where to start, or you have a question, please do reach out. I put this out there all the time. And every single time a handful of individuals come back and they say, hey, I'm putting in together a permeable driveway or I'm building my first bioswale. Where do I do this? How do I source this? Where, you know, what soil mix do I use? What plants do I use? Uh, please help. My whole thing is I want to empower everybody. I want to empower you and inspire you. And if I can help you in any way to make your first venture into green infrastructure successful, I will absolutely do that. So thank you very much for spending your time with me and I'd be more than happy to take your questions. So I guess if you want, just feel free. If you have a question, unmute yourself and we can go from there. Thank you so much, Trevor. That's, that was fabulous and a whole lot of good information and practical steps to take. So. Well, all right. If nobody has anything. No, no, no. We're, we're going to have some questions. People just have to get over a little bit of shyness. Okay. Well, and like I said, you can always reach out to me on the other end. Tell us a little more about the uh, the NGICP. So NGICP, National Green Infrastructure Certification Program. Like I said, it's a 35-hour course. Uh, I am one of the instructors. And it, it we go through, we cover rain harvesting systems. We cover permeable pavements. We cover bioswales and rain gardens, green roofs, blue roofs, dry wells. Uh, constructed wetlands. We cover all of these things, the basics on what they are, essentially, basically how they're built, um, and then what to look for when they are working and successful and what to look for when they are failing. Like I said, then you become a certified um, inspector or you, you know, it, it, it brings you on your way to installation and maintenance. Now, within that core curricula that I need to teach. There's a test on the other end um, th for getting your certification. But within that, I share a lot of other presentations that I've put together, things similar to this. And we do real deep dives into putting together permeable driveways, putting together green roofs, putting together uh, rain harvesting systems and dry wells. We do a more of a deep dive. So the idea is that you'll become more comfortable um, with that, and you'll feel comfortable either designing it or going out to install it. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's really the idea behind all of it. Again, it's really to get you certified uh, and to get, um, to get people empowered. So we, have, we do have a question about permeable driveways. Do I have any examples? Not really sure what you mean by an example, um, but you know, permeable driveways say can be done with permeable pavers, which uh, any paver manufacturer like Teco, Cambridge, Ideal, um, they all make, they all have their version. What is is a solid concrete paver that has exaggerated joints. Now all permeable pavement, the thing, the, the, the thing behind permeable pavement is it's built with grades of gravel. So you start with one and a half inch crushed stone, then you get three quarter inch crushed stone, then you get three eighths crushed stone, and then you're gonna put your pavers. You're not putting sand, you're not putting stone dust, not doing anything that's gonna choke out the water or hold water. The whole idea is to just allow the water to pass through. And the amount of water that you are trying to um, percolate into the ground is uh, determines the basin that you're going to build. So, Let's just say you're putting in a patio. Normally you dig, say, I don't know, six to 10 inches down to build your base. Well, now you're gonna go 10, 12, 14, 
depending if you're trying to uh, infiltrate the water from the from the uh, the drains on the house. So uh, that there's that. Then they have pervious concrete, works the same way. It's all about that base. It's all about those grades of gravel and creating the storage, and then having these pervious concrete, pervious asphalt, the pavers. There are grid systems, those grass pave and grid systems that you can put down. All different types of permeable pavement that will allow the water to make its way back into the ground instead of running off. I've seen those, uh, the pavers, I've seen pavers put down where it seems like that they just put them down on dirt and then, or maybe they put them down on some gravel, but it, it's real easy to imagine the situation where it's not done right and they don't do very much good because they're just you you you're you're describing where you know you have layers of rock un underneath the pavers correct and so this is where when you get into people who have been say the, in the landscape community for a long time and they've built tons of patios and tons of driveways and they're like yeah yeah I know how to do this and they order in your permeable pavers and then they fill them with stone dust and it's it's different. It, there's a there's a big change here in that the paver itself, the brick, is is the same. That's like almost apples to apples, except for the exaggerated joints. It's the application and how it's installed um, that is that is different. The other uh, one of the questions I get all the time is like, what about a gravel driveway? Or in oceanside communities, they say, what about the crushed shell driveways? Those are not necessarily permeable. Those are semi pervious just like your lawn is semi-pervious. You know, they, they are so compacted that the water doesn't necessarily make its way through. So it, it, those are not permeable surfaces at all. They are definitely uh, semi-pervious. You know, back to the lawns, one of the recommendations that I give, and if you're in the business, this is maybe something that you could take on to just show your client that you're thoughtful. And if you uh, have somebody who comes and takes care of your lawn, this is something that you can think about. What I tell my clients to do, I do not do lawn care, but what I tell them to do is not turn on their sprinklers if they have irrigation. Don't turn on your sprinklers when the, when the days you're gonna have your grass cut. Because what happens is the sprinklers go on at 4.30 in the morning, that top inch or two inches is still sopping wet. When they arrive at eight, they drive around with all their mowers. Now they've compacted the soil. The soil gets compacted. What loves compacted soil? Crabgrass. So then they can come in and be like, hey, you got crabgrass. We got to sell you a crabgrass treatment. Nobody ever turns around and be like, the crabgrass is your fault because you squished my soil. You know, so, it, you know, it's a thing. So we have to just, it's, it's, it's making all these connections. And that's what I really like about this group because I see in, in since I've been following it, that a lot of people are making these little connections and that's how we're going to have change. What can you tell, I know green roofs are this whole big topic and you could probably talk for an hour or two it's its own about presentation. <laughs> green roof. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we can have you back for green roofs, but uh, what's, the, what's the elevator speech on green roofs? The elevator speech on green roofs is they are a wonderful um, form of green infrastructure. The idea there is this, we're taking this, area that would normally be hot and reflective and we are putting vegetation up there that vegetation is going to slow and it's going to slow the amount of water that makes its way down the roof drain to the street say it's going to reduce the volume of that water it's going to slow the velocity and it's going to help cool through evapotranspiration the area now Anybody could probably make, you know, build themselves a permeable patio and permeable walkway, you know, with enough, you know, energy. Roofs take a little bit more thought and planning. Roofs involve structural engineers. A lot of people ask me to make, hey, can you just put this on my shed out back? And I say, get a structural engineer. And they're like, well, a structural engineer is going to cost like $3,000. I don't want it that bad. And I say, there you go. Because I'm not going to throw a green <laughs> roof on your shed and then have it collapse in the winter and you know crush your yeah, motorcycle because right. then i'm on the hook for your motorcycle right. or you're riding on your ride on mower so like no you know as, as great as i think that is you know you have to be really careful with where you put green roofs uh and where they're installed because they it has to be able to support the weight especially in areas like mine where we get snow 
what are some other strategies for like a typical small lawn, like, you know, rain gardens, um, berms, swales, ponds? How can you, what can you use to catch rainwater so it will infiltrate? So my, um, my biggest thing that I advocate for is everybody taking responsibility for their runoff. If, if that had been a rule in the state of Massachusetts, we would not have the water quality problems that we have now. We wouldn't have the flooding issues. It is a, it is a law now in the city of Boston. All new construction or major rehab, you have to keep all of your water on your property. So one of the best ways to do that in a single family, say, residence is through a rain garden. Um, so <clears throat> rain gardens are one of the best ways what, you, what you're going to do a rain garden is essentially a perennial garden that is slightly depressed, meaning it's lower than not sad. So <laughs> it's going to be about six inches deep in the center. It's just a gentle basin. You can either run, either direct your downspouts to it or run your downspouts to it. And it's just going to catch that water and hold it while it perks back into the ground. So that is one of the easiest ways you can catch uh, catch that water. If you have, say, like a gently sloping front lot that runs out to a sidewalk, then the best thing you could do would be to create a rain garden right there before the sidewalk, a long, big perennial bed that would just catch the water as it moves across the grass, etc., but keeps it from leaving the property. Um, there's a lot of different theories on rain garden construction. I say just use your favorite perennials because your rain garden is probably going to be dry more than it's going to be wet. So never use wetland plants. Um, just pick your favorite perennials. My suggestion, again, is always because it's all about regenerative land care and making that impact is if you're going to create a rain garden, well, then why does that why not double that as your pollinator garden? Mm -hmm. You know, why don't you fill it with native pollinator friendly species? You know, one of the big things totally different talk, maybe I'll come back for it. But one of the big, the big things about native plantings and stuff that I love, it's not really a, a trend, it's not really a cool thing. Why I use native plants is I could plant this and that's great and it'll be beautiful, it'll make me happy, it'll make the client happy and that'll be wonderful. Or I can plant this and by planting this here, I may single-handedly have prevented a, a native species of bee from going extinct. So it's like, you're instantly like you just, I just, you can just run around all day with a cape on if you wanted to, because the acts that you're doing are, are keeping species from going extinct, keeping our planet from, you know, tipping over the edge. It's just, it's wonderful, you know, and it's, it's not necessarily like that, that hero syndrome, but I'm just saying, it's like, if you can make, if you can have that impact and create this little tiny garden that could save a species from going extinct, why wouldn't you, you know, and then I look at this, you know, this exotic plant and I'm just like, well, why? I can do so much more with this. So like, that's huge. So Trevor, it's, it's easy to see how if you live in a relatively dry area or an area that has long dry seasons, it's easy to see why, you know, proper rainwater harvesting can really make more water available for your plants and trees. But, you know, I'm in Kentucky, you're in Massachusetts, we get, we get upwards of 40 inches of rain per year. Do, does rainwater harvesting uh, in, a, in a wet climate like ours also make a, a big difference in the water available to plants and trees and vegetable garden, that kind of thing? So, if, I mean, depending on how you rain harvest, if you're, if you're catching from your roof, I don't, I don't advocate for um, using it on vegetable gardens because you don't know the chemicals that are leached off of the roof. However, like I said, think of the things that you use water for. So if you are topping off a hot tub or a swimming pool, if you are washing your car, if you power wash the outside of your house, whatever, like think of ways that you use water that you do not need drinking water for. See, the thing is we have potable water. We have drinking water in our toilets. Our toilet water is cleaner than the majority of the world drinks, mm -hmm. you know? when you wash your car, that is precious drinking water that you're just letting run down your driveway. So there are, even in wet areas like Massachusetts, uh, like Kentucky, like 
they're even in wet areas, it can make sense um, to have that water. If you pay for that water, the rain harvesting systems are one of the few really um, green infrastructure systems that have an ROI. There's a return on investment there um, because you're going. If you pay for your water, you're gonna you're gonna save you know save some money. So um, you know this it's 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 definitely a even in wet areas, uh, it's a good idea. In drier areas, yes, even more. And if you have water bands in your area, you know, definitely, because it'll, it'll keep your gardens going um, when you're not allowed to use the municipal water. I see that Nick has his hand up. Yeah, greetings from uh, Coastal California. That was a great presentation, Trevor. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so I'm here on... Uh, uh, Coast Miwok territory and salmon were the staple protein for thousands of years, all from here to to Alaska. And there is a, especially in the coastal coho, there's an extinction spiral uh, where we have about two percent of historic numbers, and we can point our fingers at runoff as being arguably the greatest factor um, in this. And so my question is, how do we really start to look at, I think what Philadelphia has done is a runoff tax. Yep. How do we build systemic incentives to, to, to make right all of these historic wrongs and blow up this regenerative economy, right? Like I, I'm, I'm, I do what you do. I do, you know, landscape scale lid and I love it, but you know what? I'm just seeing how slow it's going and the, and the, the, de the demand is not, the system's not there to help us. You know what I mean? No, it's absolutely true. And that's why we really just have to, we have to do what we can do uh, and advocate where we can. And we also, again, like we have to start drilling down you know, to the source where I said, like, we don't, we need to stop calling it flooding and start calling it infiltration problems, you know, with the runoff, it absolutely is. And the thing is, it's been proven. Now, I would love personally, is if we, if there were, you know, a, essentially a stormwater tax, like, um, like Pennsylvania has, or like Philly has, I think it's great. I think it makes people aware, people don't like it. However, it, it, it caused, it was a cause for action. I have architect friends down there. It was a cause for action, which was great. It was a boom in the landscape construction industry, which was great for them, you know? So it was a business creator by doing this because people had to have permeables. People had to have bioswales. They had to reduce their footprint, you know? And just like, I don't know if it was everywhere, but here in Massachusetts, when they started saying recycling, people were like, what are you crazy? I have to separate my plastic and my paper and <laughs> nobody's, how am I ever going to do that? And now we just do it. Now we just, that's how we think, you know, and it's, and it's, it's real, it's real easy. So we just have to get past that, that change, that hump, you know, that, you know, and once we get over it, it just becomes a way of life. Now, just up from you, you know, we all hold, you know, Seattle and Oregon, like, you know, as the, as the shining, you know, stars of, of green infrastructure, but they only became that way because they got sued by the government because their rivers were burning. So like they had to go all the way wrong to now become the poster children, you know, for the green infrastructure movement. The, but the piece is, and where it is in government is we have to stop talking about it. The studies are there. We don't need more studies. You know, we don't, everybody keeps stalling it and, oh, we don't have the money. We don't have the maintenance. So a lot of the things that I do now are creating programs that simultaneously create the, the maintenance portion of it. So like we'll install rain gardens and we'll use those rain gardens and the people who install the rain gardens are actually going to be the people who are going to maintain them later. Now they've put them in, they've learned about them, they know how they work, they know where everything goes, and they know what they're supposed to do. So they'll know when it's not working. You know, so it's like it's trying to eliminate those, uh, those pieces. When municipalities say we don't have the staff, I say, well, I got a bunch of entry level workers right here, who just spent two summers working on maintaining rain gardens. So let's take that 
you know, excuse right off the table. There's just, there's a lot and they're going to keep throwing it because change is scary. So we just have to keep, you know, you're going to, you, you look at your issue and you find your angles. Don't let them keep you out. You just keep, I mean, all of, all of us entrepreneurs and everything else, we're, no, we're not going to let anybody stop us. We're just going to keep running at it from every angle until we can find a way and we'll make incremental change. You know, and anytime you can jump on and advocate for the salmon, you know, and the importance of that, because that's huge mm -hmm. out there. Um, just the, the, the life of the salmon, but the role that the salmon played in the forest and just the connection, you know, all the way back. It's just that's it's really talk about magical. It's amazing how much it played in the ecosystem out there. So that's the, I mean, that's the best advice I can give because there's no way we can just say, hey, you change everything because they're not going to. We've been doing that for a long time. So that's, it's, that's not going to be the way to go. But I think we can keep kind of ratcheting it up and making it harder and harder for them to say no. Well, let me uh, share something. Trevor, I think you and I are kind of on the same page with this. Um, you know, it, it would be nice to think that we could change public policy, but that's hard. And in the meantime, uh, I, I think Trevor and I are both committed to kind of a model where, you know, wouldn't it be great if more and more people could make their living, uh, could have a profitable, successful business doing this kind of work? I mean, doing work that is not only you can make a living at, but it's doing something meaningful for the world. I mean, how many people would like to uh, leave their corporate job where, where they don't find a whole lot of meaning in it and do a, a business where you can help people harvest rainwater with all the benefits that go along with that? And then, you know, there, there's plenty of work to be done. We need people that are able to do the work and also at the same time kind of... Um, you know, promote themselves, get more people on board with the need to do the work. Absolutely. I mean, I would like to see, and one of the things I can't wait for uh, is when there is enough green infrastructure in a, in a community that there are green infrastructure maintenance companies like there are lawn maintenance companies. There are people who specialize and they go up on roofs and they do your mm -hmm. roofs or they clean out the municipal, you know, they just you know, they stay on top of it. They prune it, they clean it, they understand it, and they maintain our green infrastructure like people maintain lawns. Uh, a lot of it, you know, is, you know, is changing the paradigm. I was talking about natives, and one of the biggest pushbacks is, oh, they're wild, oh, they're crazy, it's ugly, it's, you know, and we have to change the way people view and the way people think about these things. Um, and I think, I mean, I think we can do that, and um, we just have to constantly, collectively, you know, work, work at that. I've worked with a number of, going back to the topic that you were talking about. I've done, done a number of projects that have been built with entry level workers. And I've done um, a, a number of projects that have been done with uh, re-entry citizens and uh, children who maybe uh, didn't make it in, in school that way. And, you know, once certain people, and I am actually, uh, one in this in this area, there are some of us who did not sit very well in the classroom. But when you put us outside, everything slows down. Um, so I wasn't a terrible student as I was as I was going through school, but everything makes sense to me outside. Uh, and I have worked with enough uh, adults and children to know and to see them and watch it all click. Get them outside, get them working in a bioswale and working with the vegetation and understanding and, and it just clicks and they're just, they get so excited about it. And if we have an entire population who is looking for a job and is excited about being in nature, why wouldn't we just fuel that? Right. And if you right. don't want to do that for a living, then don't. But there are a lot of people <laughs> who do want to do this right. for a living, right. you know? So it's, I, I think we just need to nurture nurture this any any way we find it you know if if you are if you've been in corporate and you're switching careers then you can absolutely become an advocate and start working for things like this and if things didn't work if the beginning portion of your life didn't work out well, then you too can jump in on this I mean like we're a huge awesome diverse community of all different levels all different you know all different ethnicities backgrounds and just all different levels of education 
You know, I sat in um, people that I'll advocate for and where I, I, I pulled, you know, some of, the, some of the statistics. If you look at John Kempf, if you look at Dan Kittredge, if you, you look at Walter Yainer, if you look at Dee Dee Pursehouse, um, if you look at uh, Gerald Pollack, uh, he did, he wrote the book, The Fourth Phase of Water. I got to sit down and have a, sit with him for like lunch one day. And we just talked and talked for hours about water and his discoveries on the fourth phase of water. It's just, I'm a water nerd. So that, that was like super cool to me. But, you know, we, we went way off script. Um, the fourth phase of water is all about how water can organize itself in this fourth phase. And potentially it could be the answer to well, how other scientists have speculated water has memory. So then I was like, is this fourth phase of water the reason trees might have memory and plants could have memory? We got crazy. We started off with storm water and then kind of got crazy on memory of trees and memory of water. But you know, when you when you dive into this stuff, there's some great, you know, great things going on and some great connections. But you know, those are very much, you know, I would have to say um, my my mentors. Um, on, a, on a national scale. And then I have people who I've come up with when I started in the landscape industry that have just, you know, shepherded me right along and teaching me the importance of soil and showing me how, the, how to make those connections in my own region. Trevor, in a few minutes, uh, I'd like you to talk about a little bit about the light bulbs that come on with people. Um, and, but first, Randy has some uh, something to share about uh, work that you're doing in northern Mexico. And then after that, um, after that, Susan Miller wants to hear about water use in electricity. Uh, so we'll we'll get back to Susan's question, but Randy, do you want to unmute yourself and and talk talk about what you're doing? Sure. Um, I'm with a, I've got a nonprofit here in. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Because the, the the signal here in Mexico gets kind of wonky on me. I'm in a very small town in the in the in the backwoods up here. Um, but I'm working in um, northern Mexico. Our nonprofit is based out of Tucson, Arizona. Um, Brad Lancaster is there in Tucson, Arizona. He's a friend out, a friend of mine. I'm sure you guys have seen his work, and um, a lot of his work has become now policy in Tucson. There you go. Yeah, and and the work he was doing was illegal when he started, and now <laughs> it's city policy. Any new road structure that goes in in Tucson has to have green infrastructure built into it for the water to be infiltrated. So that's huge changes that he's created over time. Um, and I started a nonprofit here in northern Mexico called La Tierra del Jaguar, or the land of the jaguar. Um, I used to manage a jaguar reserve here in, in, in this town of Sahuaripa, Sonora. So it's the northernmost breeding population of jaguars. And some jaguars make it into the southern US. A lot of folks in the US don't know that, but they're, they used to be all the way to the Grand Canyon, um, the bottoms of Colorado, and different areas like that. So, um, so we're working here where the breeding populations still are trying to strengthen that outwardly. But the main key we have here, the problem is overgrazed lands, which lead to water runoff and erosion. And that leads to less herbivores and therefore less feed for predators and therefore cattle being more at risk. And so ranchers killing jaguars and it's a vicious cycle. It is a but vicious it all cycle. it started with our misuse of water. Yep. That's misuse of water and plant. Like that's, you know, the, the, the lack of infiltration, which is the, the main service that plants provide in this type of an ecosystem is being able to help infiltrate that water, as well as the cooling effects and all the things that you mention regularly on, on this group, you know? So um, our main work starts out with watershed restoration work. And then we're going into permaculture, you know, regenerative agriculture in a lot of different, in a lot of different varieties, but the basis is all in water and how to slow it and infiltrate it. And all of those things, and I'm I'm the the town here that I'm working with is a pretty big town. It's the base of the municipality here. It's uh, called Sawaripa, Sonora, uh, Sawaripa in, in 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 more English ways of saying it. But um, they were recently talking about channelizing the river here, and running concrete through town. And I went and talked to the mayor and was making it really clear that you know the, the lands the lands next to the river are going to dry up. The the shallow wells that everybody uses aren't going to be valid anymore. You're going to have more erosion problems, more runoff problems by speeding the, 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 the water up. You're just causing more problems further downstream. 
And so um, they're starting to, to listen and to think of other ways to do the work here. But, you know, I'm really working in the, I mean, people in, in the States are hesitant to want change. And where I'm at, it's, it's magnified. And that's part of the reason I'm here is because I really feel like this is the place where the work can have the biggest impact. But um, definitely just want to thank you for this talk and, and thank you for the work that you're all doing in, in these areas, because this is the key to healing our planet is doing these, these types of projects, whether it be in, in urban areas or in rural areas. It's all about infiltrating that water, creating that mm -hmm. green light, creating mm -hmm. those small water cycles again, and having, you know, becoming the solution yeah. instead of the problem as people ourselves. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, like, I like saying that um, it, to me, I can't prove it, but to me, it's intuitively true that if we could harvest rainwater worldwide, I think that would solve two thirds of the world's problems. You know, not least of all, because that would return uh, a measure of economic power, if you will, to it would democratize the the productivity of the earth, and people people would be able to have uh, local uh, food production and other fruits of agriculture locally, so that they could then have strong local economies. So. I agree. And before I got invited to come manage the Jaguar Reserve and do all the and, and got dropped into the work I'm doing now, I designed walls that hold water. So they're a, they're, they're a concrete wall, 24 inches thick. So it looks like a, a thick adobe or, a, or, or whatever wall, but they've got a water cavity inside them and, and are designed to be um, the thermal mass, you know, the, the passive heating and cooling, all the different things. You can cool water and heat water much more efficiently, all those things. So um, I was working on those designs and my plan with those was to create schools in third world countries with a section, a portion of the profits, because if you put the water systems in at the schools, then it makes it much more matriarchal and much less likely to be taken over by someone with money and them then, you know, create profit off that system. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things I wanted to do with those systems. And I think that that's something that wherever you're working, the ability to try to put that stuff in the hands of those people who are less likely to want to monopolize it and and just capitalize on it for themselves any way we can find to make those kinds of systems real is going to strengthen like you said those livelihoods and that and that possibility for those communities to create their own food and all those things randy what's so, your last name young Good. young viegas uh, my mom my mom is from the mountains of chihuahua so that's that's my spanish is my first language and my dad was from the mountains of Wyoming, so <laughs> I'm somewhere in between. Excellent, that's awesome. Thank you so much. That's that's some wonderful work you're doing, and you and Thank you are hundred you are hundred percent right with every you know with everything you said, and you know um, Hart, you are you know as well. It it all makes those connections. I mean, if if we have plenty of water, we have great farming. If we have plenty of water, then in parts of the world, you know, girls can start going to school. So then we have, we have education, we have food, we have, I mean, it all comes down to really just controlling that water and, you know, reducing the amount of, of, of FEMA money that has to go out, you know, and save people and bail people out. So it's, you know, it's, it really, it, nobody, you know, we all realize, but I don't feel it's really given um, its due the amount of impact that just smart design and focus on, on water and climate will, will change. Yeah, and it's like a lot of this work can be done by local people. In fact, it, it creates jobs. It creates work to be done. Yeah. And, and especially in dry areas, but probably everywhere, it just, you know, there's, there's, uh, I'm wanting to say there's an immediate return in terms of agricultural productivity. Certainly within the year, uh, you've got more, uh, more food production, you've got better drinking water, you've got a cooler more climate or more regulated climate, probably you know, not as hot in the summer, not as cool in the winter. You've laid the foundation for tempering these weather extremes. You know, when we talk about climate change, if we only talk about it in terms of global average temperatures, then we're missing an important part of the picture. We're missing the uh, you know, precipitation as part of climate change and, um, you know, strong winds like hurricanes and tornadoes are part of climate change. Flooding is part of climate change. And most of that, in my view, is a function of land use 
more than what's in the atmosphere. Is it land use and more than just what's coming out of the tailpipes? It's more mm -hmm. than fossil fuel. It's greater mm -hmm. than fossil fuel. Because mm -hmm. like you said, thinking about the winds and the amount of storms and the temperature fluctuations, you know, which are, are creating those winds. And, you know, what we're dealing with here in the Northeast is the hurricanes or the remnants of the hurricanes that are, you know, barreling into to Florida and New Orleans and everything, they're making their way further and further up the coast. They're starting to readily crash into New York, you know, and New Jersey and, you know, getting into Connecticut, you know, and we're just a little bit further up. So, but like the number of rain events that we're having that are like three, four inches out of whack, not just over a couple of days, but in like one day, you know, is, is tough and it's making it hard to design uh, to design these systems, but it's also making it imperative to design these systems. Because if we're going to start, it's only a matter of time until they start making their way all the way up. But if we're going to get back to back as the hurricanes move up, you know, four inch events after four inch events, you know, with saturated soil, that's going to start causing some damage. So we need to, we need to plan on that. Yeah. And if you could get that rain to infiltrate more, there's mm -hmm. a tremendous capacity to to soak water into the soil if you have good soil. Yeah, it it, it did for millennia until we paved over it. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Can Miller. I interject? Can yes. I interject? Because I want to um I want to go I want to include Marin's question about the uh, four percent. You use a a metric there, and early in the conversation, so maybe you could talk about that. Uh, source that. Where does your four percent of excess carbon number come from? Was that, your question. That, that, but, yeah, but that, also, that. excuse me. Let me just finish. But also earlier on in the conversation, you were talking about oh, you know, this buzzword sustainability, and what I'm dealing with is policy. And so my local elected officials, they say, oh, we want to be sustainable, and I'm like, really, you want to sustain what we got going here? But okay. You know, we can update your language later. However, when they say this new development is going to be sustainable, they say things like it's going to capture 20% of the stormwater runoff when I talk to them about water, but also, oh, it will have solar panels or, oh, we're all going to sign into, you know, better electricity and everybody's going to have an electric car. And then you made a comment about water and electricity. So my question was, about is there a calculation for what that, because that was an eye opener to me because I think a lot about water because I'm a <laughs> gardener and I grew up on the coast of the Gulf of Mexico and, you know, but I'm, I'm very water focused. I'm not very electricity focused. No, but that's just one of those, those, those sneaky things because we don't equate electricity with water but not just hydrologic power, but I mean, if you think power in general to create power with the cooling, the massive amount of cooling that has to happen, let's just say nuclear power or whichever, the amount of water consumption used in the creation of electricity. Uh, now I know that varies, like this is just like general out there because it varies what type of electricity are you creating, uh, you know, and, and the like, but, overall, the general um, numbers that I have found have all been around, that's where I got the 220, have all been around 220 gallons per person in electricity consumption, which then, like I said, got me thinking about electric cars because we're focusing so much on emissions right. and we're doing damage on the other end, trying to, to make a huge impact on this end. So um, just to just to go with the the four percent question, just real quick, because I saw that it came up again. Um, the the numbers, like I said, were aggregated from those those people that I met. But we're, what we're talking about is the hundred thirty billion tons of excess carbon in the atmosphere. So we're out of uh, we're talking the overall. And what we don't take into when we talk about excess carbon in the atmosphere, we talk we think about when we talk about fossil fuels. But in reality, the fact that California is burning on a regular basis and Australia was on fire for who knows how long and so was Greece, like all of that is creating excess carbon in the atmosphere. We don't think on that and we don't, um, 
you know, we don't equate that to, to anything because it's natural. It's the trees burning. We're worried about the tailpipes, but you know, all those trees burning, the fact that California is, you know, burnt up. And like I said, Australia as well, you know, all of that is excess carbon going into the atmosphere, which is creating haze, which is creating heating, which is moving its way around the planet with the winds. So like all of these things are connected. And like I said, we need to zoom out because if you get so focused on just one thing, you're not, you're not going to see it. So, I mean, I absolutely am all about elimination of fossil fuels. I think we've gone beyond that, um, you know, and, and we're, we're more than that now. Um, you know, we found other ways to, to create power. It, it was great. It got us where we are. I say the same thing about plastic, you know, wonderful things happened with plastic and the creation of plastic lives were saved things. The whole world was changed. Wonderful things happened. We now have better things than plastic. So why do we keep using plastic? You know, it's one thing to have it, but now once you know better, and once we see how much damage plastic is doing, you know, why don't we just really focus on reducing that and not just recycling it or using it only where it has to be used because we don't have to use it for all the things we use it for. So like, these are the things, like I said, we need to just start designing and thinking smarter because plastic is great for some things, but we don't need it anymore for other things. Fossil fuel, well, so I'll even say like fossil fuel might be great in some areas, but we don't need it for everything anymore. You know, uh, the, the types of electricity, like if we can start just rethinking how we use these things and also working our way, as I spoke about in abundance, uh, you know, these, some of these studies that I've read speak going back to abundance is talking about how we're not going to have the ore to manufacture our technology, like our computers and our smartphones and all these things, because we're running out of it. And we're going to have to start mining our landfills to get back our TVs from like the eighties and our, you know, our, all of our cables, you know, from our first iteration of our, of our cell phone, like all of that's there. And we're going to have to start mining that, you know? So it's like, we need to start thinking, okay, well, why don't we make, you know, tech, technology recycling easier? You know, one of the things I talk to the EPA quite often, and one of the drums I beat with them, because like we have like one day a year when you can dump toxic waste. Well, why don't you, if you make it easier, then we won't be dumping so many things down the drain because somebody's going to be like, well, I got a half a paint can. I'm just going to dump this just this once. But there's a lot of people who are doing it just this once because they don't want to wait the year. They don't want to be tripping over it. So it's like if we made it real easy to get these things responsibly taken care of and didn't have to sit on them and oops, I missed that day because I was at a barbecue and now, you know, whatever happened. It's like if we need to think about how we can make these things easier technologically recycling easier. It's a whole lot easier for me to just dump that big mountain of cords that I have, you know, into the trash rather than waiting for the techno day to, to recycle it. So it's like, again, zoom out and, th and think of these things on like a, on a, you know, a large, a larger, larger scale. I like saying, you know, uh, what was the, uh, Annie Leonard, uh, the, the story of stuff, talks about extended user, extended producer responsibility. Uh, if you sell something, especially if it's a product, think of a car or a cell phone, the company that made that car makes a profit from it. Uh, who better to, uh, who better to reduce, reuse and recycle that car than the company that made it. So they should be obligated to the tune of say 5% of the, of the original retail price. They should be obligated to buy it back. You know, save it from the landfill and put the burden on the instead what we do is you shift the cost onto the public and um you know shift the cost onto us in terms of municipal waste or or diminished health because of the in the, in the landfill it gets into the water etc absolutely if i'm trying to get rid of a tv or a any kind of large you know dryer or something like that i gotta pay like 50 bucks or whichever to you know have it get picked up and and do these things and it, sh it just shouldn't be that it shouldn't be that hard you know so but like i said it's just i think i think these are all things that we we just need to consider i know we're here we're talking about water you know and the like but again like what i really try to encourage is everybody just to kind of zoom out and look at these issues and try to and get to the to the source of the issue and also, you know, zoom out and think, okay, I want to have whatever this is. How do I have that in abundance? 
you know, the rotational grazing. I love, I, I could go all day on that as well. You know, all, all of these things are just wonderful, wonderful topics, you know, that I love seeing talked about on here and that, you know, each one is like an entire week conference in itself. Sounds great. I, I have, I'm sorry, I have been inattentive to the raised hands. We've got Nick and Marin, who was first? Marin, you want to go first? Unmute yourself, please, and ask your question. Um, yeah, I was the one who pegged on your 4%, because uh, mm -hmm. it's not 4%. Um, we know the budgets of how much fossil fuels have been burned. And we know the isotopic makeup of fossil carbon versus modern carbon. Um, so yes, there's a contribution of burning and deforestation because as you point out, there's a lot of organic matter in the soil. And so when they deforest and then that soil is eroded away and all the life in it dies and becomes atmospheric carbon um, or worse yet, methane, um, that is part of it, but that is not 95% of it. That is 10 or 15% of it. Right. And so it's, I, I got a climate scientist right over there. Working okay. On <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm certainly not going to argue with you. Yeah. Those are the numbers and that, you know, I, I've, I've been working with. Those are from the studies that I've read and you yeah, know, well, that I've worked on. It, it's, it's, it's well known. The, the, I, I will, the budgets of fossil fuels, we know how much fossil fuels have been extracted and burned and how much carbon that puts in the atmosphere. Absolutely. And it's most of the excess. I mean, we've expanded, there've been a lot of deforestation long before um, the industrial revolution. I mean, they plowed under most of this country. What was originally forest became prairie and in some cases desert. And, um, and all that a lot of that happened before, and that, that contributed, but it's since the industrial revolution that we went from 270 parts per million to almost to 415 where we are now. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's, it's mostly fossil. And there's a lot of uh, also issues with the, um, Hart has propounded the unimport relative unimportance of uh, fossil fuels, and there's issues there too. But I figured I'd peg on this one number that you quoted, and it's just really, really wrong. Okay. So, so what you, <laughs> but do you, do you, will you agree that fossil fuels and 100% focus on fossil fuels? is kind of a fool's errand and not the only thing that we, um, not the answer oh, to certainly everything? Certainly not the only thing. And there's many, many reasons to, re, to afforest and reforest and plant natives and, and do green infrastructure, infrastructure. I mean, I'm sitting here surrounded by five rain barrels, a roof garden, a rain garden, and massive soil building. I pick up everybody else's leaves off the street and I bring home other stuff to just I'm I'm a soil factory and okay. so I the the tactics there's plenty of reasons to do it but it's not the only thing it's not even the most it's it, yeah fossils Mar really are and, the biggest and Trevor th this is a worthy uh discussion and um I would welcome the opportunity either via email or another zoom mm -hmm. call to bring to bear some, uh, you know, some research on what, you know, what is the current source of atmospheric carbon? Uh, it would, uh, you know, Ju Judith Swartz has uh, quoted a figure of, uh, you know, fi like 50% of the carbon in the atmosphere, excess carbon in the atmosphere came from the came from the soil and the forest. That, that would be easy for me to believe, but I don't have the research in front of me. Uh, I don't have the, none of us have, you know, it's hard to pull the stuff out of your back pocket, but mm -hmm. it, it's an interesting conversation to have. So why don't we do that? Sounds good. Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah. I, I'm, water, a, I'm water is not a climate incredibly, scientist. Yeah, water is incredibly important. It is the, the biggest, the strongest greenhouse gas, but it's, as you pointed out in the beginning, it's always been there. It's always circulating. Things that we do to how it circulates are good to do, but they are kind of at the fringes of the fossil problem. Uh, I, uh, okay, this is the impression that I get uh, from, you know, Walter Yenny and, and others that um, 
you know, there's a, there's a percent, maybe 1% that represents, well, when you talk about the greenhouse effect, there is a, you know, there is a certain amount of incoming energy and there's a certain mm-hmm. amount of outgoing energy. And if that, if that excess is like 1%, And if you can change the surface temperature, if you can have more plant matter on the surface of the earth through forests, through gardens, through changing our agriculture so that you don't have as much bare ground, if you can change the surface temperatures, uh, for for one thing, there's an opportunity to change from, you know, does the sun shine on a solar powered hot plate or does it shine on a solar powered air conditioner? Uh, And that shift uh, in from hot plates to air conditioners, uh, plant-based hot uh, air conditioners, you know, I don't think it takes, uh, I mean, that to me can create a whole lot of cooling and, and, and quicker cooling than relying on the decades it's going to take in the best case scenario to draw down carbon. I just think water is a quicker, cleaner, cooler way uh, to actually cool the planet. So that's that's one thing. And then the other thing is if you look at if you look at renewable energy, uh, the way it's always kept the way I think the the narrative that's being advanced that I think is false, misleading, and deceptive is that if we just change the way we generate energy, then everything's going to be better. But if, if, you know, if you look at the realities behind solar and wind and, and biofuel, biomass, uh, then you, a whole lot of fossil fuels are, are involved in that. A whole lot of water pollution and air pollution are involved in that. I think solar energy, for example, has its place. Uh, but I don't think solar and wind are going to redeem us from our current levels of energy production. I think our current levels of energy production need to go down by about 75%. Otherwise, it won't matter how we generate the energy. So those that those are the I'm I'm subject to con- correction. Those are the impressions mm-hmm. that I have. Mm-hmm. I think we have no right to think that we're going to heal the climate or heal the biosphere if we are still spending more. Uh, if we are still just out of control, military industrial complex, transportation, surveillance agribusiness if we don't get control of those industries we have no reason to believe we have the carbon is not gonna you know carb the carbon we spew out there is not going to go down see, seriously just by changing mm-hmm. the method of energy generation that that that's how i see it i don't pretend to know mm-hmm. everything i don't pretend to be that's just how i see it i, I think industry is really re- wall street is is really really they love it when we think mm-hmm. that the solution to the climate and the biosphere and mass extinction is a device they can oh, no solve. they don't they don't love that because they i mean who are the richest people they are fossil people and they would love it and that's why they're bringing out carbon capture and sequestration, which in terms of energy generation is unproven at scale. It is, it's, it's just a way to keep sucking on the, the fossil teat and spend a lot of money, whether it's taxpayers or ratepayers, it's hard to know, but the CEOs are staying rich and getting richer. So I agree, it's not the only thing. There's a lot of stuff that needs fixing. Basically, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, and I'm doing what I can to put on the brakes. In and that's well, that's what I was going to say. Is but you know, we're we're all, all we can. We do. need to go with all things, but I don't think we do ourselves any good. We do not advance any kind of good movement by 
saying things that are not accurate. Right. So I think everything everything you're doing there is awesome. I lived in Somerville for 10 years, right next to Arlington. And, you know, maybe we cross paths. Um, I lived in Teal Square. <laughs> and um, so, and I still have a lot of connections. And if anybody in Boston asks me, you know, what do I know about, you know, green landscapers in Boston? I'll send them your way. But um, so all the stuff that you're doing is great. It's just some of the inputs and it's, it's important to do. It's like, there's lots of reasons to buy organic food. Part of it is what you're putting in your body. Part of it is the sustainability of the agriculture and living soils. Part of it is being better to farm workers who aren't having to be cancerous blobs of tumors from all the poisons they're spraying. And there's, so there, there's many reasons to do everything. There's all kinds of reasons to do all of this. It's just, it's not, it's not the answer. Okay. Any more than fossil is the only answer. So I want to hear from, um, Nick also had his hand up a while ago. Is Nick still with us? He Nick's is. Ready. His hand is down though. Okay, let, let me, uh, we need yeah, to wrap I'm, it up in just a minute. Let me uh, kind of establish an agenda for the next few minutes. Uh, Nick, please share. If anybody else has something that they want to, a question they want to ask, a comment they want to make, that would be great. Let's bring the focus back to water and the content of Trevis, uh, Trevor's uh, presentation. And then Trevor, maybe you can wrap it up by either giving us a pep talk about the uh, calls to action and or uh, talk about how there's been some transformation in people that have experienced your work firsthand. Okay. Nick? You're on mute. Yeah. Um, my hand was actually up from my first question. I forgot to put it down, but I, I, I would just like to say thank you to everyone. It's been a great discussion. It really has, you know, it absolutely has. And I think with what, with the discussion that we just had, I think, you know, definitely, you know, one of the biggest takeaways and Nick, it goes right back to what you and I were talking about. You know, we all are in, you know, different parts of the country, different in different communities. And we are all, we all do, we're all in different, you know, walks of life. You know, I am not a climate scientist. I am a stormwater and regenerative landscape professional. So I am, I am going to take it upon myself to do everything that I can via my design and installation and via my ability to uh, empower and inspire others to, you know, that, that's, that's going to be my drum that I am going to be, you know, to, to help, you know, create climate resilience um, and I guess combat climate change, although that's a very kind of puts negative things out there. I would rather create climate resilience. Um, so, I mean, like, I think that right there, you know, is probably the best and, and the one takeaways because, you know, Nick, you're, in a, you're totally on the other coast. You know, we, we do similar things, but, you know, you face different challenges and, and deal with different things. Your runoff's different than my runoff, but we're all kind of focusing, going back to heart, you know, if we kind of focus on water and the power of restoring water and the power of restoring soil, and I also, you know, the whole point of um, some of the pieces that I was bringing up is that there isn't a silver bullet and there isn't just a one thing that there is a lot going on. So, and we all, I mean, if you're in tech, if you're in whatever, we can all bring something different, you know, to the solution. And I think, I think that's really it. It's, it's zoom out, it's do what you can and, and don't wait to be saved because that's not going to happen. Um, you know, certainly we, if, when you're dealing with the way things have always been done, which is the most dangerous phrase in the English language, you know, when you deal with the way things have always been done, you just got to keep kind of moving around and figuring out a way around it. Like I said, you know, the, the example that I gave was when people told me time and again, we don't have the staff for that. I started using grant money and the like to create the staff for that. So then they couldn't tell me any longer that they didn't have trained people because I just did it for you. So, you know, you just we just have to find ways to keep taking the excuses off the table. Hmm. 
and with the natural pressure of climate change and the pressure of the people, I think we will affect change. I think it absolutely will happen, but we need to do what we can do and not zoom out because when you zoom out and look at it all, it's too big. It's too big, it's too much, and there's nothing we can do. But you know, in reality, and everything that was just said in the conversations and in the chat, we are, we're all on here doing something. And you know we're all affecting change and that's exactly how it's gonna be. And if you're doing it on the West Coast and I'm doing it on the East Coast and we got all the middle America happening there too, that's it's gonna be great. And that's where it's gonna, that's where it's gonna go down. So like I said, it's all, it's all grassroots, you know, and I feel very hopeful and I feel very confident. I just wish that groups like this existed 50 years ago or so. I know we didn't have the internet, but like that's when we really needed to, you know start start taking it you know seriously so you know they say best time to plant a tree you know was whatever 50 <laughs> years ago second best time is now so we may as well just do it now so that i guess that that's that's exactly what i'm gonna you know finish on and you know i would love to i would love to see you know as many through through emails and through chats and through this group i would love to be led to you know to more studies and as much information as possible because i just keep taking it in you know, I have been for 20 years and my feelings and my points of view and my approaches to things have evolved, um, you know, over that time. I was, you know, very much water focused before and now I'm very soil focused. Mm -hmm. uh, I always respected the soil. I'm not saying I didn't, but like I, it took me time to realize how much just simple compaction is thwarting all the things that I'm trying to accomplish or how much the, you know, how much the sponge itself and water storage, you know, thwarts so much of what we're trying to do from crop production to microclimate cooling. So, you know, there's just, there's a lot. And I'm just, you know, I just, one of the things I like about this group is just, I just keep eating up this information and I take it and it chases me down a rabbit hole and I love it because, <laughs> you know, when I come back out, Trevor, I'm a little uh, dirty, but I'm smarter for it. Yeah, Trevor, I'm going to say a few words in conclusion. Would okay. it be real hard for you to get back to your contact information so we could have your contact information on the screen? There we go. Perfect. So, uh, Trevor, thank you so much for joining us. I, I love your positive energy. We will definitely do this again routinely if you have the time and if you choose to. Um, I love the what you say about taking the excuses off the table, like you're training people, like I've trained your staff. Now you know how to do it. No more excuses. So, um, and uh, say one last time, tell us uh, just a little bit about the the um ngicp NGI program CP. it yeah. is yeah it's green uh, it's green infrastructure certification basically it's a basic certification uh i've had any everyone from uh people just starting out in landscaping to engineers take it uh to get to get the certification and it's 35 hours of learning about different types of green infrastructure how to construct them, how to maintain them, how to inspect them. Uh, and then, like I said, in my class, I haven't taken anybody else's class, but we do a deeper dive uh, into really more of the how to and uh, much of like, say, the science and the theory behind it, uh, you know, rather than just this is what it is. So the program itself is designed to help you pass the test to make you a certified installation in, uh, inspection and maintenance professional. And then on top of that, we kind of go a little bit deeper because I want to empower you to feel comfortable with these systems, how they go in and how to choose what system is best for what situation so that you can go out and actually start implementing them. So and that I'm starts gonna... in February. If, if anybody's looking for a class soon, that's February with me. If you listen to me talk this long, 35 hours of me, um, but then uh, there are people who hold them all over the country. So there might be one, you know, right near you. Trevor, that's great. We're going to end the, we're, I'm going to end the live call, but uh, anybody who wants to hang around just to chat, um, we're going to do that too. So I'm going to end the Facebook live call and then uh, uh, we'll stick around. I, I will, I personally will stick around as long as anybody else wants to. And I'm just trying to figure out, I, I clicked on the wrong button. 
let's see how this works here. There we go, more, and I'm gonna stop live stream. Thank you everybody.